following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Introduction to Initiatic Kabbalah. So our topic today is about something that we often speak about in almost every lecture. Uh, Many times we reference the Tree of Life or Kabbalah, and we state that in a previous lecture we've spoken about such and such thing. And of course this is true, however... It's difficult to put all these different pieces together into one cohesive whole by looking at all these different lectures. Secondly, this study of Kabbalah is often very difficult because it is a very profound science. We say it's the science of numbers. And in a different way, we can also say it's the science of receiving, the science of consciously receiving. Because... The word Kabbalah comes from the Hebrew Kabel, which means to receive. So to be a true Kabbalist, you are someone who is receiving. Now what are you receiving? Obviously you're receiving those values, those numbers that we were talking about. But those numbers are representations of something conscious. So often we represent the Kabbalah, in relationship to the Tree of Life. This is Hebrew, or in Hebrew it's called Otz Chaim. And Otz means tree, and Chaim means lives. So really, a more accurate translation would be Tree of Lives. But we call it the Tree of Life. Um, In a certain way, you can look at the ten Sephiroth at the Tree of Life and say that each one of those is a life. So you can see how that is the lives. So this tree... Uh, Typically we say it's ten sephiroth, but there are other parts to it as well. We have three aspects of the absolute, which are on top, above keter. That's the ayin, ayin sof, and the ayin sof aur. And below Malkuth, we have another set of sephiroth called the klipoth. And the klipoth is in relationship to the inferior worlds. Klipoth means shells. So there's some type of activity there related to um, destruction, related to an uh, inferior type of development, Um, whereas the superior aspects are these ten sephiroth here on the second slide. So these ten sephiroth represent an organization, and this universe, this existence, organizes itself again and again in different ways. And we can use this glyph or this symbol of the tree of life with its ten sephiroth to represent those different types of organizations, those different levels of experience, different uh, orders of magnitude of the different cosmos. So we can see essentially here um, three different triangles. In the first triangle we have Keter, Chokmah, and Binah. And then going down, we have Hesed, Geberah, and Tifereth. And then going down again to the third triangle, we have Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. And below Yesod is Melkuth. 
And we are going to talk about each of these sephiroth in detail in a little bit. First, I think we should talk about this representation is something that is universal. Often we have a, an exclusive type of um, association with Kabbalah, specifically with the Judaic tradition. However, this science of numbers and the science of receiving is something universal. And when we look at the symbol of the tree, of the tree of life, we see that across all the major religions and all the traditions. And on, on this slide, we see, of course, Christian, Egyptian, Buddhist, uh, another representation of Egyptian, Nordic, and Mesoamerican religious iconography that is symbolizing this creative uh, element, this tree with these different branches. And then those branches are rep <coughs> representing something, different aspects of existence. You can see um, on this Christian depiction, um, 12 disciples with Jesus in the center. And you could make um, a map or representation of those disciples in relationship to the different Sephiroth. So, in a certain way, the um, historical Kabbalah, where we're pulling out of the Judaic tradition, it's, it is appropriate in a certain sense because a lot of masters, a lot of initiates came down in that tradition to teach more specifically related to that science of numbers. So there's a very rich tradition. In the same way that Buddhism has a very rich tradition related more to the mind and to meditation, um, the uh, Judaic tradition does have more of an emphasis of, of explaining all these different relationships. And that's why we pull from that tradition probably more than any other. But we can find very profound parallels in other traditions as well. So when we talk about Kabbalah, we are not pointing towards a specific tradition. We're really pointing towards the, the science of receiving God. And that reception or the, the way that this tree of life is unfolding, as I stated previously, can take or can be a map for different organizations. So for example, our physical body is an organization of matter and has some representation with the tree of life. So we have an image here on the right that is showing the ten Sephiroth and its relationship on a physical body. On the left, we have this large elder, the cosmos human here, um, that is showing four different worlds mapped on top of this kind of tree of life, cosmically speaking. And we can also, of course, relate the tree of life to different levels of our being. So let's take a look at different ways that we can organize the tree of life, because this is what's a little bit confusing, is that sometimes we talk about different levels of manifestation. Sometimes we're talking about different dimensions, different worlds, different type of initiations, different types of the soul and the spirit. And we always point back to the tree of life. In one sentence, we might be talking about um, a different level of being. In another sentence, we might be talking about a different cosmos or different world of Kabbalah. And, and these are all related in certain ways. But if you don't understand each individual representation, you may become confused. Um, so before we get to that, let's talk about the absolute, because above the tree of life are, is what we said before, the Ayin, Ayin Sof and Ayin Sof Aor. And this is where all creation manifests from, and this is where creation always returns to. So the Ayin means nothingness. Then the next level of development is the Ayin Sof, which means limitless. And then the next level of development, or the outer sphere, we can say, is the Ayin Sof Aor. So obviously, anything that is related to the absolute is something that is not related to this existence. So although we can put words and concepts and point to certain things at the absolute, those concepts which point to it are not the thing itself. We, any word, any concept even any imagination that we have about the absolute is really just a representation. It is not the thing itself. 
So we use different words and different concepts to get some type of um, understanding of these levels. But in reality, the absolute has nothing to do with this universe. It creates it, but anything in this world is, is not going to exist in that world. In the same way, we can play that linguistic game that it is the nothingness, so it is the no thing. Whereas this world is the thing, or the things. But nothing is the no thing, the th- that which is not thing. And there's um, a way that Samael and Veor says this, is that uh, to be is better than to exist. And so what does that mean? That is something to meditate on. That the being is before it exists. And that isness is something going on in the absolute. So in the ayin, that is the the complete absolute abstract space. But from that, something is already beginning to crystallize, and that is called the ayin sof. We can think of the ayin sof as certain atomic particles in the ayin. So already we're talking about something there. Again, these words don't really do justice for what it really is. But we can say the the atoms of the ayin are the ayin sof. So the the ocean is the ayin, and different atoms in that ocean are the ayin sof. In the same way that if you have a cold glass of water on a warm day and the condensation begins to crystallize on the outside of that glass and little bits of water begin to form on the edge of the glass. That is the Ain Sof coming out of the Ain, we can say in this symbolism. It's beginning to, it's beginning to manifest out of the nothingness. Now from the Ain Sof comes the Ain Sof Aur. The Ein Sof or Eor is that light which emanates from the Ein Sof. So the Ein Sof is something that each of us have. We have our inner atomic star. The ray of light which comes out of that atomic star is the Ein Sof Aor. Or we can say all of the rays that are coming out of the Ein Sof are the Ein Sof Aor. So the Ein Sof Aor is almost that activity of that light going down and beginning to create the tree of life. So our true, we can even say the being of our being is the Ain Sof. We have a quote here from Samael Anveyor in Tarot and Kabbalah. He states, Ain is the same as Sat in Sanskrit. In other words, the unmanifested absolute. The Ain Sof is the second aspect. It is where a certain manifestation already exists. It is the place where all creatures abide when the great pralaya, or cosmic night, arrives, because they do not have the right to enter into the ayin, into the unmanifested absolute, which is beyond thought, word, atom, sound, beyond all of that which has form, number, weight, etc. The ayin sof aor is the third aspect in accordance with Hebrew Kabbalah. Here we find the first cosmos, the purely spiritual protocosmos. It is the solar absolute, which is formed by multiple spiritual suns. So the protocosmos is a purely spiritual cosmos, which is unmanifested. Nevertheless, it is the first type of manifestation. So moving on to what we call the seven dimensions. Because out of the absolute emerges everything. And one way to organize or view that everything is in relationship to the seven dimensions. There are seven fundamental dimensions. However, we sometimes say there are seven dimensions within every fundamental dimension. And this just relates to different qualities in that dimension. The seventh dimension, or the zeroth dimension, the radical dimension, is the very root of dimension itself. It is abstract space, and it is related to the three primary forces. So the three primary forces, 
which we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or we call uh, the Holy Affirmation, the Holy Negation, and the Holy Reconciliation. These are how creation is made. Whenever something's created, it uses the law of three. So we need three forces to create. So these are the three primary forces which exist in everything. The substance of everything, you'll find those three primary forces. There's also in this dimension we can say is the locus of Christ. Now, this word locus, it just means location over locality. It's not locust. I'm not saying locust, but locus. Locus or location of Christ. So the Christic energy or that source of Christ, there's different manifestations of it. Ultimately, obviously, it's coming from the absolute. But in its, in its going, taking steps down. But the Christ as three, is found in that first triangle. So when we point to Christ, we're not just talking about the Son. Because sometimes in Christian terms, we talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you're coming from that background, we mention Christ, people may confuse this symbol and look only at Hokmah, which is the second Sephiroth, and say that's Christ. And that's true. Because we say that the most beautiful atoms of Christ are in that second Sephiroth. However, Christ manifests in different ways. And obviously, Christ as a three is a perfect multiple unity. So those first three Sephiroth are all within each other. So within the first Logos are the second and the third. Then the second Logos is the first and the third. And within the third Logos is the first and the second. So the first, second, and third Logos is another way of talking about Christ as three. Now moving down to the second triangle, we see the sixth dimension. And this is the, we can say, the area of the spirit. And we can call this objective space. So this is, a, this is what we would call really the first level of manifestation here. And we have our spirit. Why is it objective? Because in this world, the will of God is always performed. There's always some type of activity here directly related to God. And it is contrasted by the fifth dimension, which is where things are somewhat different. And there's a more of a separation from God here, or from, the, from Christ. And this is where we would call the locality of the soul. Now the soul... And the fifth dimension here is only really pointing to two. However, the soul kind of also is related somewhat to, the, to Tifereth, which we'll get to that in a moment. But the, main, the main thing to grasp from this slide is that there is the physical body, obviously, the soul, the spirit, and Christ. Those are the main concepts here. And also, of course, the ego. And the ego is that self-will that, that, that does not do the will of God. And that manifests in relationship to the fifth dimension. And that is, the, the ego really is located below Malkuth, below the tenth Sephiroth in, in the Klipoth. And that is why it's down here, lower. We say the inferno is the area of the ego. So there's a representation here that although we may have, you know, we may have a dream, for example. And that dream is happening in the fifth dimension. That dream or that experience may be related or may be a reflection of the objective space. It may be coming from our spirit. But that dream which is happening in the fifth dimension may be coming from the inferno too. And it's only through a discernment, through meditation, through comprehension that we can say with clarity whether or not that experience was related to the spirit or related to our ego. So just because we have an experience out of our body doesn't mean that we are experiencing objective space. We talk a lot about the astral world and astral projection. But the astral world is dual. It's, it depends. A superior or, or you know, a... a an authentic experience, which is coming from the spirit, can quickly change. 
and become an experience related to the ego. In the same way that we can be self-observant during the day, and then one moment not become self-observant. We lose our attention. Because our attention, our consciousness, is going down and inhabiting one of these inferior sephiroth. So, the fifth dimension really is that duality. The fourth dimension is very much related to the first three. So the first three dimensions of the world that we are most accustomed to, our physical body. The fourth dimension is connected very closely to the first three. And in the Bible, it's related to paradise or to Eden, to a kind of terrestrial paradise. We say that um, the first three dimensions fell out of harmony with the fourth dimension. So we have our physical body and then our vital body in the fourth dimension. In the fifth dimension, we have our center of gravity with the soul. In the sixth dimension, we have our center of gravity with the spirit. In the seventh dimension, we have the center of gravity with Christ. And in the inferior dimensions, there's a center of gravity of our ego. And here, Samuel Unviar states in the Revolution of Beelzebub, the soul aspires for the union with the innermost, and the innermost aspires for the union with his glory on. So the innermost is related to the spirit. So the first, we can simplify this, you know, initiatically. First, we need to unite and develop our spirit. Then we need to un develop and unite with Christ. And that's really a very, very short synthesis of the self-realization of the being. So this word glorian is related to the being of the being, which is this sphere above the top triangle. So we have seven dimensions here. And we need to understand them also in relationship to seven cosmos. And again, there's a lot, of, a lot going on here in this slide. There's another way to understand the ray of creation, which is coming out of the absolute that ray of creation, which we start at the Ein Sof Or, that Ein Sof Or manifests itself in creation in what we call the Eo Cosmos. So in the Proto Cosmos, where the Ein Sof Or is, there's one law, the, the unity. And that is an abstract cosmos. A single divine law. But that law, in order to create, manifests itself in three laws. And that's what we call the Eo Cosmos. So what is written here is, is all the worlds of the ray of creation correspond to the Eo Cosmos. So the Proto Cosmos is an unmanifested abstract cosmos, a spiritual cosmos. The second cosmos, which is called the Eo Cosmos, corresponds to all of the, the worlds in, in creation. And at that level, there are three laws. So you can see there's a little bit more complication there. From there, the next level of cosmos which is created is called the macrocosm, or the macrocosmos. And that's related to the next triangle down. That in order to create that cosmos, we need to add more laws because we build on top of the previous cosmos. So we have the three original laws of the Eo cosmos plus three more to create a new cosmos. That's why the macrocosmos has six laws. So the macrocosmos is already much more complicated than the protocosmos, which has one law. Nevertheless, the macrocosmos is still something very spiritual. The will of God needs to divide itself into what we call six laws. So this is similar to, if you could imagine taking sand or some type of cinder and creating a, a cinder block, a small block. And then wanting to create bigger blocks out of, that small, uh, out of those small blocks. You may make a bunch of these small blocks out of this fundamental substance. And then you take six of those, or three of those, to make a bigger style of block. 
And you make a bunch of those blocks. And you take six of those and make a bigger block. So in, in this bigger block, you can manifest, you can look at it. Fundamentally, it's made of that same sand, or that same ash. But that ash was organized into tiny blocks, which are part of a bigger block, which are part of a bigger block. And that's what's happening when you're going down this ray of creation, is that you're taking that organization and you're using it to make a greater organization. So from the macrocosmos, go to the deuterocosmos, which has 12 laws, then to the mesocosmos, which has 24 laws. So the macro, the macro at six laws is, is all the suns of a particular galaxy, such as the Milky Way. The deuterocosmos of 12 laws is one of those suns. Then within that organization of the sun, we have any planet within that solar system of that sun. And that's the mesocosmos. Then within any planet, there's another level of creation we call the, the microcosmos, which is the human beings on that planet. And that is 48 laws. And then below that are different inferior uh, worlds related to the tritocosmos, which starts at 96 laws. And there are nine levels of the infra dimension there, each one having 96 more laws than the previous. So we can see that in the Trito cosmos of 96 laws, we're very, very much more complicated than the three laws of the Ao cosmos, or even the six laws of the macrocosmos. So what does this look like in real life when we are in our, f in our physical reality? <clears throat> we can meditate and look at how complicated our life is or how complicated living is. When you are somewhere in the woods or living in a, more, in a very rural environment, things are a little bit simpler. When you're living in New York City or any city of this world, things are much more complicated. To get something done is much more complicated. There's a lot more laws, a lot more rules. Not just even laws of the government, but laws in the way people interact with each other. So even now in this world, in the world you're supposed to only have 48 laws living on that earth. But in cities today, we're actually bringing those 96 laws up onto the surface of the earth. We're bringing the complication of hell up to the surface. And that is why it's becoming more and more complicated to live. Because we are attached to those inferior dimensions, those inferior sephiroth, which have more and more complication. Because obviously it's our mind, better said our ego, which is causing the complication. And when you live in a more complicated world, it's less happy. It takes more effort to overcome them, to achieve that happiness. We see in uh, the 48 laws, which is our physical body, very much related to our chromosomes. Normally, we, uh, scientists say we have 46 chromosomes, which are related to the physical body. The vital body, which is connected, or is the superior aspect of our physical body, contains two more chromosomes, which are tetradimensional, which are not seen by the microscope. So the 46 of the physical plus two additional ones related to the vital body of the fourth dimension is where we get 48. So our body is, is created by those 48 chromosomes related to the 48 laws. So how do we relate the seven cosmos to the seven dimensions? Fundamentally, we have to realize that every dimension or every cosmos here has those seven dimensions. Our physical body has seven dimensions. The earth has seven dimensions to it. Every atom of space has seven dimensions to it. This, like I said, is an organization of those atoms. In different, in different ways. So we don't want to say, we don't want to just, you know, we look here at the, mac the macrocosmos of six laws, 
which is the second triangle, the middle triangle. Related to the dimensions, we say it's related to the sixth dimension. But really, here, the macrocosmos is related to all the suns of, this, of any particular galaxy. And we can look in the space and see that. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't look at the macrocosmos and say it only exists in the sixth dimension. Nevertheless, there is a specific center of gravity related with the sixth dimension, even when we look at it physically. So in history, people would point to the sky and, and say the heavens. And we know that, that there's space out there. But really that space really does have a relationship to the heavens because there's less laws. You know, in the same way that we are bringing hell up into the earth by our, our, our center of gravity being so low, when you go into, when you get out of the orbit of this planet and go into space, you are really living under less laws. And if you were to attempt to travel and to enter stellar space, you would be really going into very, very pure atoms, which really, as someone like us with ego, is really against, against the divine law to enter into those spaces. So, we have the seven dimensions, seven cosmos, and we also have four worlds. And this is where things get even a little more complicated for people. They, it's really difficult to see how all of these things are really distinct, how they are distinct and how they are related. The four worlds are, re are related to, again, how something is created. but in a different way. Because if you think about how, how does something get created, we can think of an architect who wants to create a building. The first thing that happens is he has it in some archetypical form, related to Atsuluth, in a sense. Then he has to actually plan it out and create it. And it still might be in the mind. First is the idea, then there is the process of really creating it, Maybe even putting it on paper. That would be related to Bria, which is the creative act of that. And then actually putting the pieces together, actually building it, would be related to Yetzirah. And then finally, Asiya, the result, the creation, the physical. We can see, for example, uh, related to the creation of a, of a body, of, of a child. We have Atsiluth would be related to the sperm and ovum. Bria would be the creative act itself of sexual union. Yetzirah would be the actual growth and development of that child. You can relate that either to the nine months in the womb, or you can even relate it to achieving maturity physically in, at age 20, per, per se. And then Asya would be finally the development is complete. So that's the way we have to understand uh, the four worlds. We look at the tree of life, the one that we always present is actually a synthetic tree of the four worlds. Because in every world, there is an entire tree of life. There are ten sephiroth in Atsiluth, ten sephiroth in Bria, ten sephiroth in Yetzirah, and ten sephiroth in Asia. And if we were to, to map it out like that, you could put one on top of the other and have 10 Sephiroth for each. However, the way we normally look at it is we just say the top triangle of Keter, Hokumah, and Binah is related to Atiluth. The second triangle is related to Bria. The third triangle down is related to uh, Yetzirah, the world of formation. And the final Sephiroth in Malkuth is related to Asya. And again, another way to, to understand this too is that the first triangle is ruled by Keter. Even though it contains Keter, Hokmah, and Binah is ruled by Keter, the second triangle is ruled by Hokmah. So even though Hokmah is existing in the top triangle, right, the ruler of Bria is Hokmah, 
And the center of gravity of Bria on this synthetic tree of life is the second triangle. And then Bina, again, is in the top triangle, but in this synthetic tree of life is related to the third triangle. So this may be really having our heads spin, but we have to look at this in the same way that we are a physical body that has three brains. So we are really three in one. And there are different ways to say that, you know, although our, we have our head, our heart, and our sex, also related to these three different triangles. And of course, the final is, is the physical, which is Asya. So all of these things require a bit of study, a bit of meditation, because, as we said, the true Kabbalist is receiving this and understanding this based on meditation and intuition. If you approach it from a purely intellectual point of view, you'll get very confused. And you won't really, won't do you any good. You need the intellect, obviously. There's a lot of, a lot of different concepts here. We say there's two fundamental types of Kabbalists, the intuitive and the intellectual. And it's the intuitive that we want to be. The intellectual Kabbalists... Um, fundamentally fall into mistakes and into black magic because they have no connection with the spirit. They're just studying it intellectually. You know, for example, there's a, in the Judaic tradition, they say you should not study the Kabbalah until you're 40 years old. So people look at that and just look at it intellectually and surface level. And then they'll wait till they're 40 and maybe start studying it. But if you know what that means, the word 40 is related to the waters, related to Mem. And what that's really saying is you should not study Kabbalah until you are uh, mature enough to practice chastity, uh, sexual transmutation of those waters. Because it's through that transmutation that you begin to receive. So now that we've looked at different ways that the tree of life is organized in a, in a kind of a general sense, we can talk a little bit more about each Sephiroth. At the top, below the absolute, are the first three Sephiroth, Keter, Hokmah, and Binah. Keter it means crown, and this is related to the father. Hokmah means wisdom, and this is related to the son. And Binah means intelligence or understanding, and is related with the Holy Spirit. And I, I spoke about this triangle at the beginning of the lecture, and we have to... Again, use a lot of intuition and meditation to really understand the Trinity here, or the Trimurti. Because within each of these are the other two. Within Keter or Hokmah and Binah. Within Hokmah are Keter and Binah. And within Binah are Keter and Hokmah. There are three in one. You know, again, in the same way that we are a physical body with three brains, we are three in one. But it's these, are, these are the three fundamental forces which are the basis of everything. They are the creative elements. This, uh, sometimes people point to this top triangle and say that this is, you know, the father, and they think of the father as their spirit. But really, that's really the father of the father. That's really related to Christ. When we, when we say spirit, just simply a spirit, we're really talking about the second triangle. Has said, being just our innermost, just our spirit. Of course, the top triangle is related to our spirit as well, because it creates our spirit. But the top triangle is related more to the being of the being, whereas the middle triangle, which we call the ethical triangle, is more related to just our spirit. Our monad. And our monad expresses itself, what we call through this, this ethical triangle. In theosophy, it's called Atman Bodhi Manas. In Kabbalah, it is called Hesed, Geberah, and Tifereth. And we can also call this the innermost, related to Hesed, the spiritual soul, related to Geberah, and the human soul, related to Tifereth. This triangle is where all of the knowledge of good and evil needs to be acquired and uh, 
or I should say the results of that knowledge, go to. Because Geberah is what we call, is, 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 Geberah is related to justice. And Geberah is related to the, the rigor of the law. And Tifereth is the human soul which has to develop. It's the human soul which can make mistakes, which can acquire karma. Now, Tifereth is very interesting and requires a lot of understanding because it is in many ways related to the spirit because it's here in this middle triangle. But it's also related to the soul. And it's also related to Christ because Christ descends into it. So Tifereth is in the middle. It's in the middle column. It's also in the center. It's in the middle of the middle. The Tifereth is in the half of the half because everything goes around Tifereth. So the one who is reaching the half of the half of the time is the one working at Tifereth because he's in the middle column, he's in the center of the tree of life, and he's achieving all of the times of initiation. So everything is centered around there. But in the beginning, we have our monad created, but that monad, although it is divine, it is lacking self cosniance It's through initiation that that self cosniance is developed. And we see here, Hesed is mercy, Gebro is justice. So this is why it's the two, the left hand and the right hand, so to speak, with one hand I give and the other hand I taketh away. Gebra is also the location of the inner kaum, which is the, the part of our being which records all of our good and evil deeds, which is why we can never get away with doing anything bad. It's in a, it's in a symbolic book that you can visit in a temple to read to see what deeds you have done. Gebra is related to the Holy Spirit above, which is the most demanding, in a sense, related to karma. As it's stated in the Bible that you c sins against the Father will be forgiven, sins against the Holy Spirit shall be forgiven, but sins against, excuse me, sins against the Father shall be forgiven, sins against the Son will be forgiven, but sins against the Holy Spirit are not forgiven. Under the Holy Spirit is Gebra, and below Gebra is Had and then, and then Yesod, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's through that left side that the severity of the law really comes down and where we feel the pain for doing evil. Whereas the right side is related to the sun, which is the supreme compassion which comes down in order to save. So below the middle triangle is the lowest triangle of Netzach, Had, and Yesod. We call this the magical triangle. We also call this the triangle of priesthood. This word magic which is, you know, in today's world, maybe people don't understand what that really means. It comes from the root word mag, which really means priesthood, to perform a, a, an act of being a priest. So it's in this level that we have hermetic magic, natural magic, and sexual magic. With sexual magic being the most important, because again, it's in the middle. So what is hermetic magic? Hermetic magic is related to um, the types of things which are found in the occult medicine book and also in igneous rose. Different types of elemental magic. Related to healing with the power of that visualization with your mind, using your mind in that way under the guidance of Christ. Hod, related to natural magic. Natural magic is certain types of Rituals, certain types of like mass or church or temple. That is what Hod is related to. And then Yesod, obviously, related to sexual magic. And it's the, what we speak about many times. If the foundation of our work is found in sexual transmutation. So when we say the word sexual magic, 
has a certain kind of connotation, but another way to say that would be sexual priesthood. And then we start, that may connect something a little bit different, to use your sexuality as a priest and priestess would. So here we, in, in this slide, we see Tifereth up there as well. And in a previous slide, we said that this triangle of Netzach, Hod, and Yesod is related to the soul. And we said that Tifereth is sometimes related to the spirit, and sometimes Tifereth is related to the soul. When we talk about uh, the inferior quaternary, which again is, an, is a, often used in a uh, theosophy literature, the inferior quaternary is these last four sephiroth, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Makuth. These are unfoldments of the human soul. So the human soul, which is willpower, unfolds into Netzach, which is the mind, the mental body, or the inferior mass. Netzach unfolds into Hod, which is the astral body, which is related to emotion, related to kama rupa. And then, of course, we have the physical body and its superior counterpart, the vital body, which is Malkut and Yesod. So we are all born with elements related to these sephiroth. But the mistake that was made uh, in other doctrines prior to this one was seeing the body of somebody of Netzach and assuming that it is the mental body. But really, it was the egotistical or lunar aspect of Netzach. And people would see the astral body and think it was a legitimate astral body, but really it was the Kama Rupa, the body of desire. And people would, these certain clairvoyants wouldn't be able to, they didn't understand the difference between the Christic vehicles and the lunar vehicles. Because each of us has a lunar astral body, and each of us has a lunar mental body. But it's only the one who does the work that develops the superior bodies. So really, Hod and Netzah reflect down into the Klipoth, into the inferior dimensions, and that's where our ego is. So we have the lunar vehicles which are developed when we are evolving as an elemental, through the mineral and plant and animal kingdoms. We have these lunar vehicles. So the soul of any elemental, right? The elemental is that naive divine spark, and it develops the soul at an animal or an instinctual level, at a lunar level. And that soul is, is just given to the elemental by nature. It's just developed through like a mechanical process. A mechanical process that's guided by um, the angels and archangels uh, of creation that are guiding these elementals up. But really those bodies are given to them. And they're mechanical type of bodies. These are subtle bodies. So really most people when we talk about astral body, they're really projecting with their lunar astral body. What we are here to develop is the solar astral body and solar mental body and the solar causal body as well. And we do that, of course, through the activity of Yesod, which is sexual magic. So again, we can now relate these different bodies with the different levels of the cosmos, which we talked about in a previous slide. So we can see that the physical body is related to 48 laws as well as the vital body. But the astral body is related to 24 laws. So if you have an experience in the astral world and it's related to the superior aspect of the astral world, you're, you're, you're having an experience related to 24 laws. If you have an experience in the mental world or a samadhi in the mental world, it's related to 12 laws. And if you have a samadhi related to the macrocosmos, it's related to three laws. And if you have a samadhi related to the Ao cosmos, it's related to three laws. So having that experience in those, in those other uh, cosmos, you have an experience of less mechanicity, of less division, of more, uni of, of more um, universal cosniance. 
doesn't mean that you, if you have a, an, a, uh, if you have a samadhi in the Ao cosmos, doesn't mean that you have self-realized the Ao cosmos. It just means that in the same way a fly flies close to the light, our elemental type of consciousness liberated itself from those laws temporarily in order to have an experience related to less laws. But in order to develop these superior bodies, we need to begin to behave in ways related to these less laws. So what does that mean? So in our physical body, we act and we behave. We have temptation for anger, for thinking automatically, for falling into fascination. If you're in the astral world, it's an experience that is more directly related to the higher, to the higher world. It's, it's one step closer to the absolute. So those experiences to become tempted into anger or fascination become quicker. They, they approach you quicker. But if you overcome that, you also have a more direct experience of being awake and one level closer to the absolute. So the higher you go towards the absolute, the more, the more refinement you need, the more development you need in your consciousness in order to be able to be cosnient with Cogn just... Cognizant. Cognizant. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, to be conscious of... To be conscious of high, you know, less laws, to be awake in those cosmos with less laws, you need more refinement. You need more development of your consciousness. So obviously, I'm, I'm really saying very, very little about all these Sephiroth because there's an, there's an enormous amount that can be said. Um, one thing I think I missed in the ethical triangle related to Hesed, Geberah, and Tifereth. You know, Hesed is the innermost, and Geberah is the consciousness, the spiritual soul. It is the part of the soul that all the archetypes are developed in. But it, it rests, so to speak, in the sixth dimension. Whereas Tifereth, the human soul, is the soul of activity that works. Tifereth is the knight doing all the work to save the maiden, which is Geberah, which is locked in the castle, so to speak. Sleeping. Sleeping beauty. So finally, below the ethical triangle is, is Malkuth and Klipoth. Malkut is the fallen Sephirah. In its rightful form, Malkut ascends up into Yesod. So we can relate this to the fall from Eden. Because Yesod is related to that paradise. Malkut obviously is the physical. And Malkut is this end point where all the different elements are, are mixed and ready to be worked with. All the different alchemical, alchemical elements. So th from that mixture, we, take the, we make extracts. And we develop these higher bodies. So there's this you know, development of transmuting sexual energy. And when you, when you are able to transmute and behave in a way that doesn't waste that energy, not just physically, not just chastity, in the physical sense, but working with chastity, first, of course, physical, but behaving different emotionally, behaving different mentally, you are conserving that energy, which is related to higher octaves. And when you, when you achieve that saturation of this more subtle energy, in association with passing ordeals related to your karma, because you have to pay what you owe, and you see how the two are related because you are given a test which sees if you can remain equilibrated, see if you can overcome that. And that test also pays your karma. So you're, you're, you're getting a test to see if you can overcome the mistakes you have made in the past or to overcome the thing you haven't learned yet. 
And if you do so, you, you are liberating yourself from that law, and that, from that type of ego, from that type of manifestation of karma. And therefore, the energy can flow through that type of environment. And when you're working with that energy, eventually you begin to saturate that energy in Hod, which develops the astral body. And then you, develop, you saturate that energy in Netzach, which is a higher degree, another octave. And that creates the mental body. And then you saturate that energy in the causal body as well, which is another octave. And that is a process of initiation. I just said it in a couple sentences, but it takes many, many years, typically. So, let's talk about Da'ath, because this is a, a Sephiroth I sort of skipped over. And again, it's another type of Sephiroth which causes a lot of confusion. And this is where really beginning to know and understand a little bit about the four worlds becomes essential. So I won't say too much about it, other than the world of creation is related to Da'ath. Everything, is, everything that's created is created through Da'ath. And I said before, anything that's created takes the three primary forces. So in this sense, it's the three primary forces becoming a duality. So you have that, that trinity becoming polarized in two ways. Male, female. Mother, father. Ama and Abba. Or Shakti and Shiva. Isis, Osiris. So that trinity becomes two trinities that are polarized and opposite. And it's through that connection that occurs in Da'ath that, that creation emerges from. We see that obviously sexually, right? You have a male with three brains, a female with three brains, unite, and they create. Whether that's creation physically or spiritually. So we can think about that and try to use that as our, our basis for understanding Da'ath. And that, that duality happens in Binah. But it happens in the world of Bria, because the world of Bria is the world of creation. So, we've talked about Kabbalah. We've, we've done a very cursory um, explanation of the different Sephiroth. The, the, the fundamental thing to take away, though, is, is you have the physical body, and of course you have the ego, but the soul needs to be created and then that soul needs to unite with the spirit. And the spirit then needs to unite with Christ or the Glorian. That's the, th that's the three main things. First, we have to create the man. Then we can create the superman. And then we can ascend into the absolute. Those are the three basic things to understand initiatically. We can divide that into all the different initiations. And this is what we talk about. The first mountain, the second mountain, and the third mountain. The full path of self-realization is divided into these three mountains. What's usually spoken about are the, are the initiations of major mysteries. Because they're seen a little more simply. The first initiation, again, these initiations are achieved by passing ordeals by working with uh, sexual magic, working with a spouse, passing those ordeals. But what is going on is not only are you creating these solar bodies, but you're integrating, you're creating the soul and integrating the spirit. Because when you achieve the first initiation of major mysteries, which is related to the physical body, something's also happening up in the sixth dimension. And that first initiation is when we say the master is born. So that master being born is a first level of connection between Hesed and Geberah, which was the middle triangle. Here. The first initiation, these two begin to these two connect in the first level, in the first way. And that's where the master is born. But that does not mean that the master is born physically. 
That's another thing. So how does the master have its first level of appearance physically? That's through the rest of those second through fifth initiation. You know, in the second initiation, the Soma Sutra Khan is born. In the third initiation, related to, to the creation or birth of the astral bodies, related to experiencing a symbolic drama of Christ. In the fourth initiation is related to mastering the mind and gaining the title of Buddha, of a Buddha. In the fifth initiation, the, the willpower soul, which is Tifereth, also now has a connection. There's always a connection there, but that connection is becoming active, I guess you could say. So it's through Tifereth, which then goes down to the mental body, the astral body, the vital body, the physical body. So when someone reaches the fifth initiation of Major Mysteries, there's a master consciousness being expressed even physically. But that does not represent the full development of the master. That's just the beginning of the master physically. Now typically, after someone reaches the fifth initiation, they choose what's called the spiral path. So when you reach the fifth initiation, there's a choice that's made. And that choice is really a choice of the monad or the spirit, whether they want to do, whether they want to rest or whether they want to unite even further with Christ. And Samuel Unvior states that typically uh, the initiates and the monad choose to go on the spiral path. And if you take the spiral path, you have a certain type of development that's very slow and evolving but you don't achieve any more initiations. And you go further and further, very slowly, slowly, slowly related to that top triangle. Now the one who takes the direct path receives an additional initiations, beginning with the initiation of Tifereth. And this is a little bit of uh, clarity here, because the fifth initiation is related to Tifereth and the birth of the causal body. But the initiation of Tifer, uh, the actual initiation of Tifereth is, is a direct path initiation. That's what starts it off and is related to the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the dissension of Hokumah, which is that top triangle. The second logos, Hokumah, which is sometimes called the Sun, descending into Tifereth as a child and beginning that drama of Christ. Then that initiate renounces the spiral path, renounces nirvana, and goes da- back down, so to speak, onto earth and to continu- continue to work. And that initiate has to completely purify and cleanse all of the lower sephiroth. So it's to work again with Malkuth in the physical body, the vital body related to Yasod, astral body related to Hod, mental body related to Netzah, causal body related to Tifereth, and these are, these are the higher octave of the first five initiations of major mysteries. So we can say in the first five initiations of major mysteries, you are realizing Christ in the fire. But through the venistic initiations, you're realizing Christ in the light. And you can see that those venistic initiations are related to uh, the drama that Christ is going through. That's displayed in the, in the Gospels the birth of the manger, the baptism, transfiguration, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the Mount of Olives. A, and then from there you uh, have an initiation related to the sixth degree, related to Geberah, which does not have a relationship to the four Gospels because it was taken out at some point. But again, that's another type of integration with with Gebra, the spiritual soul, but at a higher octave. And then the seventh initiation related to the crucifixion, related to Hesed. And then finally, the eighth initiation, which is related to Binah. So, when we talk about Hesed and Binah, you see there's a huge gap. And the one who's working, completing the first mountain is attempting to cross this gap. And we can say that no human being could ever pass this abyss. 
So it is through death and resurrection that that abyss is crossed. I'm going the wrong way here. So at the end of the first mountain is when one one achieves the resurrection. And when, when, when one achieves that resurrection, they are bringing down all that energy directly into the physical world. So you see different types of development here, right? Because when I talked about the fifth initiation of major mysteries, you said that the master has a direct connection with the physical world. But not until you are incarnating Bina are you completing that connection all the way to Christ. And you're resurrecting that in the physical vital world. You should, we should really properly say the fourth dimension. So all that, all that uh, um, development and integration is happening in higher and higher degrees related to the first mountain. And then, we, and then for the, the initiate, they have to move on to the second and third mountains. And the second mountain is related to doing the first nine labors of Hercules, which again, you're, you're, you're achieving... All of this, uh, all these additional works, not initiations because you've already been initiated in all those levels, but you have to completely clean or completely develop all of the relationships to heaven and hell of the moon, of Mercury, of Venus, of Sun, of, the Mar- of Mars, of Jupiter, of Saturn, of Uranus, of Neptune, and then finally paying eight years of qualifications, which we call the ordeal of Job, and then finally you incarnate Binah with that resurrection at the end of the second mountain. And you are perfected, in a certain sense, in the world of Yetzirah. So Asaya is the lowest, it's your physical body. Then one level up is Yetzirah. So most of the path is related to developing the world of formation. That world of formation is complete at the second mountain, so to speak. But there are still higher levels. And that's related to the third mountain, which is working in Bria and Atziluth. So we can say Hokmah and Keter because those are the rulers of those worlds. But in synthesis, we really don't have to worry too much about that <laughs> right now. But in synthesis, you can see how different levels are developed. The soul is developed, then the, all the ego is, is destroyed, and then higher levels are created. And in that final synthesis, we want to return back into the Ein Sof. So we started near the beginning of this lecture talking about the Absolute. And that is where we are going to return. Whether we return with consciousness or complete development or not, we are going back to the Ein Sof. So this is what we call the difference between the Ein Sof and the Ein Sof Parinishpana. So Samuel and Veor writes, we must make a specific differentiation between the Ein Sof and the Ein Sof Parinishpana. In the Ein Sof, interior self-realization does not exist, but in the Ein Sof Parinishpana, interior self-realization does exist. He says somewhere else, the light is expanded at the dawn of every creation and then gathered into the bosom of the Absolute at the end of every creation. So you can see on the left would be the Ein Sof related to just these three primary factors, the Logos, Christ, and the Ein Sof Parinishpana related to the development of that whole tree, but synthesized into the Ein Sof, integrated completely all the way up into that divine star. And the one who's fully developed in the Ein Sof Parinishpana has the right to enter into the Ain, which is that 13th level which is uh, related to something else. I would imagine another type of development. And we'll end uh, this lecture talking just a reminder about the three factors and that it is the, through the three factors that we achieve these different initiations. And Samuel Anvior writes, the initiatic path is a true revolution of the consciousness. This revolution has three perfectly defined aspects. First, to be born, second, to die, and third, to sacrifice ourselves for humanity, to give our life for humanity, to struggle in order to bring others to the secret path. 
So you see that the first mountain is most related to being born. The second mountain is most related to death and resurrection. And the third mountain is related to ascension, but also that third mountain is really related to those masters that are uh, coming down, like uh, anybody who's created, any of those avatars creating religions. It's called the guardian wall of humanity that's protecting and managing the karma of this entire planet. And even Jesus, who is a Paramatta Satya, who came down in order to help us uh, to sacrifice himself for this humanity. So do you have any questions? That's a good question. So where, where in Buddhism they talk about achieving enlightenment. And in the West, we have a very simplistic view. And I think even in some schools of Buddhism, there's a, a simplistic view of enlightenment. Basically, there are different degrees. Um, we can say, for example, someone like Yogananda, used as an example many times, he really awoke. He, had ver he was a very awakened soul. He had a very awakened mind. He cleaned a lot of his mind. So he, he was awakened. Um, the word enlightenment is more of a Western translation. Most of the time, really, we're talking about awake, being awake because the Buddha means to be awake. So really, if we, if we look at it from being awake, like, for example, like I said, he was very awake, Yogananda. But he did not achieve even the first initiation of major mysteries. But he was able to go out of his body very easily. Not his solar astral body, but his lunar, elemental lunar body, which he cleaned very well. But he was an elemental essence that, had, that was very awake and paid a, a very good amount of karma and made, and made a lot of superior good efforts that put him in a place where he'll be able to achieve those initiations in a future incarnation, a future life. So that, that question really needs to be qualified more because what level are we talking about? And this is part of the difficulty between, for example, one, for example someone who's, who's a saint versus someone who is an avatar. Right? There's a huge difference between someone who's doing a lot of good works, who maybe is meditating even a lot, but if they're not achieving these initiations, then they really, they might not even know what they, what, what they don't know. They may think that they're awake. That, that was the, the case of Yogananda. He thought he was awake and developed. He didn't realize that he was lacking the solar bodies. It's through the solar bodies that you have more capacity, more energy to see more. So you see more into your own personal hell, which you then have to clean. So enlightenment is a process through this initiation. Now, one thing I hear is uh, on the fourth initiation, I have a new Buddha has been born. I don't want anybody to think that uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni was only a fourth level initiate. That's not the case. It just means that the lowest level of being a Buddha is the fourth initiation. Because the Buddha Shakyamuni is a very, very high initiate related to the third mountain. So, being awake starts here and now. And the initiations are the way that our, our vehicles are created and purified so that we can see deeper and do greater works. You know, in the same sense that we can walk, or if we have a bicycle, we have a vehicle that we can go further and do more with. We have a car, we can go a lot further with that. But if we have a rocket, we can go all the way to the sun. And these are really the differences. You know, some people are really working with uh, just walking or just using a bicycle. And some schools have higher or better vehicles. And really the, the vehicles that we're trying to work with is related to that rocket. Of course, you only choose that rocket when you go into the direct path, which is the fifth initiation. That's good. most of the people that he's addressing in his teachings uh, do not have the solar bodies, do not have the, the higher solar astral. Um, 
I'm assuming that we're we're utilizing the, the lunar astral to do all of these excursions and, and to learn how to can, mm -hmm. can you talk about how that experience, you know, gaining experience with the lunar astral will you know connects up when we create a solar astral body or is there is there any relation and oh. Right. If you don't, if you do not have the solar bodies, then yeah, you can still have a, a positive experience, astral projection, with the lunar body. It just, if you think of it, almost if if you're in the lunar body and you're present and awake, your essence is there, which is the the active perceiving element, and you still can have an experience related to the to the objective aspect of the fifth dimension, related to the sixth dimension. And that's a good thing. You receive all that information, those, those experiences. Now, when you are uh, achieving the third initiation, that astral body is forming little by little in nature in the same way that a tree grows from a seed. It very slowly grows. Uh, it, you know, that development is, re is replacing the lunar aspect. So until you, until you uh, completely kill your ego... You still have, it's, it's, I should back up. So for example, if you achieve the creation of the solar body, you still have a lunar body. You have to kill that lunar body. And this is what we call, um, I'm losing it, the double center of gravity. Hasnamusin, yeah. Hasnamus, the double center of gravity. So you that's so that's why even if you achieve the fifth initiation, you can still have a lot of ego left. You now have the vehicles to completely reduce your ego, eliminate it. But you can achieve even the fifth initiation with a lot of ego. Typically, you, you do, because you don't have the vehicles to see it all. You need to achieve a, you know some death, but the main death happens after creating the vehicles. So you create the vehicles so that you can complete that that, that uh, destruction and elimination of all the egos. What about uh, <clears throat> with all the new fifth initiations? What if you're not a Christian? What, what if you don't what, you know, believe in Jesus? Or what if your, your incarnations were attached to a Buddhist or an Egyptian? Or what, if, what types of experiences? Are you? Okay. Right. Okay. So, okay. So, if you are, so if you if you're not Christian, if you're reaching the Venistic initiation, you've already achieved an, an, uh, such a level of development that you would not be identifying with your ethnicity or your cultural religion. Now, you could still be completely seeped in that that symbolism. When you would experience, you may experience these different initiation uh, Venistic initiations, maybe. May, may look a little bit differently because those symbols exist in all the different traditions. So it may, there may be some different symbolism experienced there. I mean, in the inner worlds, uh, the symbol is just a representation. So whether you are Christian or born in a different religion, um, it's, it's irrelevant because those, those are just symbols for values that exist. So if there's an initiate who already who is finding the path again, who already has a solar body. So if they're finding the path again, that means that they lost the path, that they fell. When you fall, you all your ego resurges again. And at that moment, you may or may not have any access to those solar bodies, depending on your karma and depending on the will of your being. You, you will still have to recapitulate the initiations. You still have to repass them. But you won't be developing that body again, because that body is a creation. That's a, those are bodies that are immortal. So the, fir, the, the immortal bodies in the higher dimensions, finally, as you, init, as you achieve higher and higher initiations, those are more, that you get that immortality even physically through the resurrection. 
It's good to note, though, that even those bodies at the end of the day, end of the cosmic day, they get swallowed up and, and become, uh, they don't become eliminated, but the, the extract or the seeds go into the Ain Sof. So we create all these bodies, even though eventually they will be uh, reduced at the end of the cosmic day. But if you have that development, then when the, cos- when the cosmic day comes out again, the, the solar bodies will emerge from those seeds. Mm-hmm. Uh, which of the two chakra unfolds first? The, the head, which is the, the inner starlight of inner God, or, the, or the Hira? So in the F... It, Mm-hmm. So the development happens with Hesed first. So I don't have the arrow here, but I have it at in the beginning. From Bina, Bina splits into Yod Heva and creates Hesed. Then Gebra is created. Well, again, I think we need to have a lot of intuition and even meditate and on the difference between Hesed and Gebra. Hesed is the, that inner light, and Gebra is the alabaster around it that, that's holding it. You can say Gebra is the one that is getting all those developments of Tifereth. Tifereth is working and giving all of its developments to Gebra. Because the, the difference between the spirit and the soul, Samuel Envior states that the spirit is but the soul is something acquired. So we have two types of soul, or the, the spirit has two types of soul, the divine and human. So in both cases, those souls are developing, whereas the spirit just is. Now, has said is that level of, of that isness. And when you go up to Bina, you have another level of that isness, and you go all the way up to the Ain Sof. So that's, that's, that's the way I understand it. Well, you could say the, the, the first is when the, ma- the master monad is created. The fifth is uh, somebody can be considered a master, being called a master physically. You, was there something you wanted to add? I'm not sure what you're trying to say. <laughs> Right. right, so the, the, in the beginning, you have that master monad created in the first initiation. It's only when the fifth happens that there's really a, a completed conduit of energy all the way down physically. Yeah, yeah. Going back to um, following up with the question I asked earlier, you spoke about self-causing things underneath, right? And where would that be? Where would that begin on the initiatic? where there is that self-cognizance of the being beginning. And would you consider that sort of similar to the term of enlightenment, where you said it is degrees and degrees, and is that self-cognizance just degrees and degrees of knowing? Right. Okay, so self-cognizance, yes, I would say is degrees and degrees of knowing. Um, the the great breath of life is said to to be profoundly unknowing to itself but it knows itself more and more through every creation through the entire experience of the whole cosmic day it gains that experience and then pulls it back to know itself a little bit more and we are a ray of that ain sof we are the ray or, or the ain sof emanates that ray which doesn't know itself and it's kind of a difficult thing to, to grasp intellectually because we always think of God as being omniscient and omnipotent. But it doesn't know that it is omniscient and omnipotent. <laughs> that, I know that sounds contradictory, but there's a certain reflection that happens through creation that then gets understood. 
So it's levels, yes, it's levels and levels and levels. And where does that level begin? You know what I mean? Like, is it always is? Is it just always is? Or especially on the path of initiation? Because there's a point that you don't even realize. You know what I mean? You don't even realize that we don't realize that we don't realize. You know what I mean? And then it becomes like this. You come here and then you're like, oh, there's so much I don't know and I don't realize, right? And then you start to work on yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Where does it begin? And I don't think there is a big. I don't think there is a beginning, but we can say that the the our atomic star was is like an ember that shot off the great bonfire of the uh, common cosmic father, mother, and we start as a little ember. And through all those initiations and developments, we develop into our own bonfire. And that's when we become a cosmo creator. And then we, that, that type of monad is capable of creating new cosmoses and new developments, new rays. And that's why there are those seven fundamental cosmo creators, that every one of our monads is under one of those rays of those cosmo creators, because they're at that level. They're just another monad that achieved all this Self-consciousness. So, so the first... Yeah, well, the thing is, that first contact of the soul with the innermost, that's, that, that's even happening as a mineral, in the mineral kingdom, but it's, it's such an elemental type of contact that it's, you can't even conceive how that develops into the type of consciousness we have now type of consciousness we have now is like an ant compared to the Paramatta Satyas. Mm -hmm. We could not understand them. In fact, Samael and Vior even says that unless you are in certain vehicles to bring that consciousness down, the, the, those beings at that level would look at us and only see like a stone, the way we look at a stone. They, they, don't even have, they have to put themselves in a special vehicle to, in order to interact at our level. In the same way we need like a microscope. So someone who has created the bodies in a previous lifetime and they've fallen, they have a double center of gravity. So there may be times when they they have that voltage, that energy created to related to those superior bodies, but it may be limited. It may may not have full access. You know. I would assume, yeah, they would be using that vehicle, but they would also have a, an enormous amount of ego. So it, it really depends, you know, if they are meditating, are they have a clear, are they awake, are they in fascination, are they so using the ego? Can you have, if you create the solar mental body, and if you've disintegrated the lunar body at some point, does the lunar body resurrect with the resurrection of the ego and the resurgence? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah, when you fall... When you fall, all all the egos come back, and it it'll come back as a lun as lunar ele elements. Yeah, yeah. So you can have all these you can have these achievements from previous lifetimes, or even 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 if you're achieving it this lifetime, you still have ego. Um, you could have you could be someone really could be saying something very profound, and then because they have the initiations and experience, and then they have the ego speaking through them later on, or at the next moment. Mm -hmm. So the seven cosmo creators. Now, there, there, there's always seven, because seven is the law of organization. But the cosmo creators of this cosmic day achieved that level in a previous cosmic day and, had the, and then became elected, or uh, they assumed the role in this cosmic day. So if you can achieve those heights now, and then in a future cosmic day, you could be one of those seven rays or one of the 12 or 24 or 48. There's different organizations. 
Well, assuming, yes, the, previ- the, the ones that are cosmic craters now in a future cosmic day would, I assume, want to achieve entrance into the Ayin. The resurrection is really at the end of the second mountain. If I said anything otherwise, it was a a mistake. Right. So to clarify. Um, so what am I supposed to do? Because the first initiation, learn to is that you have to be you have to have a partner, right? Is that correct? Correct. To enter the first initiation of major mysteries, you need to practice with a spouse, mm-hmm. sexual magic with a spouse. So how does someone who's single work with this, with the Kabbalah? Well, it's similar because Yogananda was a master at meditation. So he was having samadhis related to all those different sephiroth, which, you know, he mistakenly concluded that he was self-realized in those sephiroth. You can still have a samadhi in the spiritual world, but not be self-realized there. So he was, so, and secondly, all the developments that Yogananda was achieving were, were very good. So when, he, when in a future lifetime he begins to practice sexual magic, he will advance very quickly, very, very quickly, because he's very strong in his, uh, you know, in his wakefulness. Yogananda died in a Maha Samadhi. Yogananda died in a Maha Samadhi. So he, he was a true, a true master of meditation, but his monad was not a master. And... It's just um, it's it's just different. It doesn't mean you can't achieve enormous benefits as a single person because you can, absolutely can. We all have so much ego that if we all developed to the level of Yogananda, this world would be a paradise. <laughs> really, really. So, don't, to, get don't get discouraged. Yeah, <laughs> that's the that's the end point. Uh, sure. To be like a child, we need to yes to achieve these initiations. We need to reconquer our uh, our childlike state, and that is related to those fewer laws. Uh, you can see we're very complicated people, and we have the, our egos of ninety six laws and greater. When we are reconquering our childhood, we are being able to express ourselves in those less and less laws that are more simple, to have a more simple mind that's not complicated. Right now, when we, in an impression hits us, we have 10 different ways of thinking about it that's confusing, and we feel three different things, and we want to run, and we want to sit in our chair at the same time, we want to make a phone call, and we want to watch TV, all these things, that's very complicated. As we remove those egos, we're simplifying. So that's, that's what that relationship to being like a child is. Yes, obviously, when you're when you're like a child, you're you're seeing the world very simply, and not pu- not adding anything to it, and your cup is empty, so to speak, to be able to receive. And in the same way that we don't want to, um, we want to eat unleavened bread. The the leaven in the bread puffs everything up. We want to re- eat unleavened bread, just the pure knowledge, just keep it simple in that sense. The leaven in the bread is all these different theories and complicating things and. Even though I talked about a lot of sophisticated things, there's a lot of theories that deviate us and that we get stuck in that are kind of a waste of time. And as children, we have less filters. As adults, we create greater filters. That's the ego. Right, right. So another aspect of, of being like a child is that a child simply expresses itself. As, an, as a mature adult, we have all these desires and contradictions, but we put a facade out that only tries to articulate just our our projected self-image that we want. It's very complicated. Becoming like a child is being completely truthful with yourself, so you never have to lie to yourself. You never have to lie to anybody else. Those who lie 
um, you know, disconnect themselves from their, their innermost. Those who hate disconnect themselves from the Son, and those who fornicate disconnect themselves from the Holy Spirit. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, I'm